जय ओम विष्णुपाद परमहंस प्रीवराज एकाचार्य अष्टोत्तर श्री श्रीमद डिवाइन ग्रेस अभय चरण अरविंद भक्ति वेदांत स्वामी श्री प्रभुपाद की अनंत कोटि वैष्णव वृंद की ग्रंथराज श्रीमद भागवतम की ताय गौर प्रेमानंदे ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय कृतनाश्रीमद भागवतम कैंटो वन चैप्टर अलेवन चैप्टर चैप्टर एंटाइटल्ड लॉर्ड कृष्णा एंट्रेंस इन द्वारका टेक्स्ट ट्वेंटी फर्स्ट भगवान तत्र बंधूना पौराणाम अनुवर्तिना यथा विद्य उपसंगम्य मानम आदधे भगवान सत्र बंधूना पौराणमुवर्तिना यथा विद्युपसंगम्य मानम आदधे भगवान सत्र बंधूना बंधु पौराणमुवर्तिना यथा विद्युपसंगम्य मानमादधे भगवान स्तत्र बंधूना भगवान तत्र बंधुनाथिनाथिनाथ्यपसंगम्य वैष्णवीस्तत्र बंधु पौराणमुवर्तिना मानमादधे भगवान स्तत्र बंधूना पौराणमुवर्तिनाद्युपसंगम्य मानमादधे भगवान Sri Krishna, the personality of Godhead. Tatra, in that place, bandhu naam of the friends, paura naam of the citizens, anuvarti naam those who approached him to receive and welcome. यदा यथा विधि एज इट बिहूज 
उपसंगम्य गोइंग नियर सर्वे शाम फॉर ईच एंड एवरी वन मानम ऑनर एंड रिस्पेक्ट आदधे ऑफर्ड ट्रांसलेशन एंड परपोर्ट बाय हिज डिवाइन ग्रेस ए सी भक्ति वेदांत स्वामी श्ल प्रभुपाद ट्रांसलेशन लॉर्ड कृष्ण द पर्सनैलिटी ऑफ गॉड हेड अप्रोच दैम एंड ऑफर ड्यू ऑनर एंड रिस्पेक्ट टू ईच एंड एवरी वन ऑफ द फ्रेंड्स रिलेटिव सिटीजन्स एंड ऑल अदर्स हु केम टू रिसीव एंड वेलकम हिम परपोर्ट द सुप्रीम Lord, personality of Godhead is neither impersonal nor an inner object, inert object, unable to reciprocate the feelings of his devotees. Here, the word yatha vidhi, or just as it behooves, is significant. He reciprocates just as it behooves with his different types of admirers and devotees. Of course, the pure devotees are of one type only, because they have no other object for service but the Lord. and therefore the lord also reciprocates with such pure devotees just as it behooves namely he is always attentive to all the matters of his pure devotees there are others who designate him as impersonal and so the lord also does not take any personal interest he satisfies everyone in terms of one's development of spiritual consciousness and a sample of such reciprocation is exhibited here with his different welcomers om agyanati mirandhasya gyananjana shalakaya chakshurun militam yena tasmay shri gurave namaha nama om vishnu padaya krishna prasthaya bhutale shrimate bhakti vedanta swami iti namine namaste saraswati deve gauravani pracharine निर्विशेष शून्यवादी पाश्चातरिणे वाचाकूभ्य कृपा सिंधुभ्य पतिता पावनेभ्यो वैष्णवेभ्यो नमो नम जय श्री कृष्ण चैतन्य प्रभु निनंद श्री अद्वैत गदाधार श्रीवासादिगौरभक्तवृंद हरे कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे 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 कृष्णा सो एम ग्रेटफुल टू बी हियर विथ ऑल ऑफ यू टुडे इट्स बिन ऑलमोस्ट टू इयर्स मोर देन टू इयर्स एक्चुअली सो आई गेट स्ट्रेंथ बाय हियरिंग द क्लासेस Radha Gopinath Temple, whichever part of the world I am in, and I'm try, I'll try to contribute in my some small way to that shower of strength that is going from here to all over the world. So today I'll speak on the topic of appropriate respect. Uh, subtitle will be like respect that respect doesn't mean agreement. and disagreement doesn't have to mean disrespect so i'll speak on this broad theme let's look at what is going on over here this is the entry of krishna into dwarka and as he is entering the various citizens are coming and receiving him and the word used over here is manam manam adadhe that krishna offers respect and what kind of respect is respect yatha vidya as is appropriate so as the various citizens come and welcome him pauranam anuvartinam as they come and approach him he offers appropriate respects to them and this theme comes in the mahabharata also for the among the pandavas yudhishthir and bhima are slightly senior to krishna and nakula and sahadeva are junior to krishna so although all the five pandavas are broadly in sakya ras with krishna but still there is a slight difference and krishna in that sense is a little more deferential little more respectful to yudhishthir and he is a, is a little more uh, offering blessings and guidance to nakula and sahadev so there but even when he is in a superior position in some way he is offering respects the significant point over here is 
that generally the understanding is God is the object of respect. Mm -hmm. that, that the whole purpose of spiritual life and especially of devotional life is to learn to respect God because He is the Supreme. Akela Ishwara Krishna Arasabha Vritya. So, so that is one understanding. It's an important understanding that we learn to respect God understanding His position. But when we are understanding God, there are two aspects. One is understanding His position and the other is understanding His disposition. His disposition. So actually understanding His position can bring submission, can bring humility and that is important. But understanding His disposition is what brings affection. It actually re helps us see that person as a warm, loving person. Say if somebody is the head of state or a very powerful government officer or a powerful military position, something like that. It says, okay, knowing about that person may bring some respect. But when we see how they personally deal with others, so that is their disposition. Oh, this person is such a powerful position, but still that person is so warm, so polite. So what happens is that brings affection. So, understanding position brings submission, understanding disposition brings affection. And so here in the Bhagavatam, <clears throat> uh, here this from, nine, uh, from the 7th chapter onwards till the 15th chapter, there is a glimpse of Krishna given as a precursor to what will be given in the 10th canto. Mm -hmm. Just like movies before they are released, there is a, like a trailer. So you could say the first canto is offering a trailer of what will come in the tenth canto. And here also Krishna's disposition is what is being focused on. So normally God is considered to be the object of respect and he is. But how God offers respect is being demonstrated over here. Manam adade. So from that perspective, the, the principle of devotion is understood by contemplating God's position that okay I have to become a devotee but the practice of devotion is better understood by contemplating his disposition how does he act so even though Krishna is not really acting as a devotee Mahaprabhu comes and acts as a devotee but even in Krishna acts he's a part of a Brahminical culture and he is not always I am God obey me that is not his mood even in the Bhagavad Gita Krishna's focus is not on his own divinity Krishna talks about his divinity primarily to persuade Arjuna as a part of the development of his argument. If that was his sole argument, Krishna could have finished the Bhagavad Gita in six words. I am God, obey me, fight. Gita over now. <laughs> but Krishna doesn't do that. So even through the Gita, actually Krishna's disposition is revealed. Manamadhade. So from this example of how Krishna is offering appropriate respects. So even when we bless, even if, if we are in a position where we bless someone, now even blessing is based on a foundation of respect. Because who is considered worthy of being blessed? Now there is some good in you and I want more good to come in for you. Isn't it? That's the, so even in blessing, it's not a position of superiority. That it's actually from a position of appreciation for the other person. So, appropriate respect is important. Now, we could go into different levels of devotees and how to offer respects to them. And that is talked about an actor of, act of instruction. But I won't go into that direction. I'll talk about situations where it is difficult to offer respect. Mm -hmm. And how do we go about offering respect when it is difficult to do so? And one of the situations where it, is, it becomes difficult to offer respect is when there is lack of agreement. So quite often when there is disagreement, what happens is it leads to disrespect. So what happens if suppose we are saying something another person is not agreeing with us. Mm -hmm. If there is not a foundation of respect, then what happens is we start raising our voice. Mm -hmm. But if there is a foundation of respect, we won't raise our voice, we will refine our argument. Okay. How? Because you know, it's not that this person is a fool. This person is not dumb or stupid or mad or evil. Okay. If 
I am not, if what I am saying is not making sense to this person, then maybe I don't understand their perspective, or maybe I have not considered the full picture. So let me re refine my argument. So when there is disagreement, if we go into raising our voice, that will only worsen the disagreement. That is a Rajasik response. And then from Rajasik, it will go to Tamasik. And that will lead to, not only, that disagreement will lead to dissension, it can lead to violence, it can even lead to destruction. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, okay, this disagreement is there. How do I deal with it? If you focus on that part, instead of raising our, raising our, raising our voice, we try to refine our argument. Okay, that means that is a more sattvic response. And by that, it is not just that the other person will understand us better, but we will also understand the other person better. We will also understand our own argument better. In the sense that, sometimes we think we understand what we are saying. But actually when we communicate to others, and then we say, hey, you know, why is this not being as impactful? So maybe I have not understood the subject better. Maybe I have not understood the subject better. One of my main services is writing. So especially if I have strong disagreements with someone, then before I try to present that, I try to write things down. Okay, what are the points over I want to say? And I find that writing brings about, at least for me personally, it brings about two precious gifts. Humility and curiosity. Because what happens is once you start writing things down, it's writing helps us discover that the things we thought we understood, we have not understood actually. There are so many things which I thought, hey, this is so simple and so clear. But you start writing it down and then you reread it, hey, you know, this point doesn't link with this point. This argument is not as strong as I thought. This I wrote down, I myself can refute it. Others will be able to refute it even more strongly. So writing brings humility. Other thing, I know everything. Oh, but I don't know really so much. So writing brings humility and writing also brings curiosity. Because while we are writing, what happens is, we are also refining our thoughts. Hey, this is not the right word. This is not the right construction. This is not the point I'm trying to make. So we learn about the subject more. So writing is basically one form of introspection. It is more systematized introspection with external tools of language. But the point is, that's one way to refine our argument. So if we are not getting along with someone, then, instead of raising our voice and worsening the disagreement, try to refine the argument. Mm -hmm. So, <clears throat> this, is, this is one way, a, sat a respectful way to deal with disagreement. But unfortunately, there is the other way, the dis respectful way of dealing with disagreement. And curiously, this seems to be more in religious organizations and religious people than in non-religious people. So the disagreement is just a part of the world. Mm -hmm. But uh, one of my friends is, uh, is doing his PhD in, in like, schisms in religious organizations. Schisms means when religious organizations split apart. So I was having an elaborate discussion with him. So he says that so in general, is if there is a secular organization and there is a religious organization. Here I am using the word religious and spiritual interchangeably. The difference is there, but it's not relevant for us. So, it says, quite often, people are able to live with differences much more, not necessarily cordially, but uh, it's like a live and let live. In secular organizations, but in the religious organizations, it doesn't work. When there are differences, often they get escalated. So, uh, what is the reason for this? So what happens is, there could be many reasons, but one major reason is that when we become a part of a religious organization, it's not just a functional thing. Okay, I'm a part of this, uh, this particular social group or I'm a particular of this company or whatever. We have put our faith over there. And we may all, say for example, we may all come to the Krishna consciousness movement. And we may say we have faith in Krishna. But all of us don't have faith, the same kind or same level of faith, in the same aspects about Krishna Bhakti. Somebody's faith may be more in the deity worship, somebody's faith may be more in the philosophy, somebody's faith may be more in the chanting, 
somebody's faith may be more in the seva somebody's faith may be more in the uh, in the uh, in the, the association of devotees just spending time with devotees and so there are different aspects of bhakti the nine limbs of bhakti and different people may have faith in different aspects of bhakti more in fact those things may be the foundation of their devotion so what happens is in the secular world disagreement is just disagreement okay it's a difference of opinion intellectual disagreement is there but in this religious organizations disagreement is immediately seen as not just a difference of opinion but as a deviation hmm? why because if my faith is founded in something and if somebody else does that thing differently then you are not just having a difference of opinion you are actually challenging the foundation of my faith challenging why because okay because what happens is to get to the what bhaktivinoda thakur says saragrahi that to get to the essence of things is very difficult hmm? it, it takes time so oh, for most of us we want to, even if we are sincere and we want to approach that essence but it takes time so till we get to the essence we often hold on to something external and it's not wrong because we can't hold on to the essence immediately and we want to the hold on to the external so that we can get to the essence hmm? and that is good if that external is helping us to progress toward the essence so for example somebody may say that they may get a lot of strength in memorizing verses and pronouncing verses properly and they love that and they will if somebody doesn't know many verses if somebody doesn't pronounce verses properly they say you know is this person serious in bhakti you know if they were serious why wouldn't they put some time and effort to improve this somebody is uh, now now yes verse recitation is important and krishna says it is worshiping me with the intelligence to study the conversation but it is actually worshiping krishna we have examples of people who might be great scholars in the gita but they may have no devotion to krishna so it's a external recitation of verses memorization of verses it is a external which can take us to the internal but suppose somebody's faith primarily comes from deity worship uh, i was so one of the schisms the big schism that happened now i don't want to criticize any particular organization but what happens is that the examples make some things clearer so there is a uh, there there are there are religious organizations so for example in the christian tradition in the pre scientific age pre pre reformation times that means 14th 13th 14th centuries there was like a big scholastic debate that me the on the topic of how many angels can dance on the tip of a needle now why should angels dance on the tip of a needle and whether one angel or 10 angels that what is the difference but on that issue there was a schism how may say what my fight on this but actually if you go into theology the, the, it was based on the idea of god's omnipotence and how god's omnipotence manifests through angels what angels can what god can do to angels what god can't do to the angels similarly there is a in india there was a there was a, a religious group you know they had different forms of wearing tilak and they had a royal elephant which would go in front of the deities with wearing a particular tilak and the two groups started fighting which tilak should be worn on the elephant and that case went up to the supreme court and before the case was judged the elephant died so now this is this may hit now I, again i said i don't want to make fun because you know for sometimes the differences that we have among devotees for outside they also feel you know, why are you making such a small thing into a big thing so what happens is when we say focus on the essence and not on other things see there is a small thing and there is a big thing and for all of us there are certain small things which take us to the big thing hmm? and that's why that small thing is also a big thing for some people but that small thing may not be that big a thing for somebody else i hope that small thing and big thing is not becoming a confusing thing now <laughs> so for somebody you know the idea how many angels can dance that is a very very important thing because it is all centered on the idea of god's omnipotence or how a particular ritual is performed how a particular tilak is worn that is very important because they feel this is how god's presence is manifesting 
it we mean a visible form so what happens is the small things we cannot consider them unimportant but if we make them all important that's the extreme you know if you consider a pendulum one is it's unimportant why are you fighting over small things but the, but this just because it's a small thing doesn't mean it's unimportant but it does not mean it's all important also the one is one thing is it's uh, don't fight over it at all just you are just making a small thing into a big thing the other is this is a big thing how can you call it a small thing so the point is there is subjectivity in how krishna reveals himself to different devotees hmm? if krishna is a person we have that beautiful verse in the 10th canto when krishna enters into the mathura arena the different people see him differently that's not just oh the young women saw him like cupid and the kamsa saw him like that personified that that's a vision but that also is a universal principle that krishna reveals himself in different ways to different devotees different people and even to different devotees so krishna's sweetness krishna's greatness krishna's attractiveness may manifest for someone through the precision of the rituals that are being performed to somebody else it may manifest with the precision with which verses are being memorized and recited for somebody else it may manifest to the precision in which the temple hall is cleaned for somebody else it may be manifested to the precision in which the food is cooked and served now all these are important but all of these may not be equally important for everyone so the so the the problem when when something which is a big thing for me i make it into a big thing for everyone and when i see that that person is not doing that thing then what happens is then i start thinking that person is a deviant because they are not doing properly the thing which is the foundation of faith for me but that may not be the foundation of faith for that other person so because of this what happens is in religious organizations it's not just a matter of difference of opinion is not just a matter of intellectual disagreement it becomes a matter of spiritual deviation so as one, de uh, one devotee was telling me that you know, sometimes some devotees you go in front of them you, when you talk with them you have to justify your existence as a devotee to that person that is you know okay if you are a devotee what are you doing are you doing this Tick, you know taking this marble taking this bullet taking this bullet taking this bullet if you're not then what kind of devotee are you you're not a devotee so what is happening over here is in bhakti difference uh, in religious circles and in bhakti also that when there is a difference of opinion there is disagreement but disagreement very easily degenerates to disrespect because disagreement is not seen just as sim a simple difference of opinion it is seen as a deviation from the process it is seen as a person having gone off track and that makes it uh, very acrimonious sometimes the attacks become much much more vehement more more much more fierce than what they need to be so so i'll take one area where this often happens within our, within our movement where disagreement very often leads to dis disrespect and how we can avoid that and then i will we have some time for questions so for shilp among the various spiritual organizations which are representing say indic wisdom vedic wisdom uh, shilp prabhupad started the krishna conscious movement and he emphasized philosophy relatively much more than most other widespread organizations there may be localized organizations in sacred places which may go very deeply into shastra but among the widespread organizations that are there not many have the ethos of a daily class and an emphasis on studying scripture so now because of prabhupad considered philosophy to be important but the nature of the condition mind is to go towards extremes and something is important we make it all important so what happens is within our movement there is a pitfall that philosophical disagreement can lead to personal disrespect that when we disagree with somebody philosophically we immediately start disrespecting the other person so 
Uh, this is due to, not due to philosophy. It is not that philosophy is not important. Philosophy is important, but it is not necessarily all important. So I was uh, once talking with Giriraj Maharaj, and uh, when he was writing this book on Juhu, so we ha I was helping in editing some of the books. So we had a lot of discussions about his experiences with, Mah uh, with Prabhupada. So he recorded many of them, but there are many which couldn't make it into the book. So he was telling one particular experience that, is, that there was this Dr. Mishra of the Mishra Yoga Studio, who, with whom Prabhupada had stayed when he had gone first to New York. Hmm? And uh, because Prabhupada was speaking personalism and he was a follower of impersonalism, so initially he was very warm and hospitable, but then he told Prabhupada, Swami, you just do kirtans. You can't speak. And Prabhupada said that that's not my purpose. So he went into the Lower East Side afterwards. So their parting was not on, you could say, on the best of terms. Because Prabhupada was, in one sense, not allowed to speak over there. Hmm? And he left over there. But many years later, when the Krishna Consciousness Movement had spread widely, this Mish Dr. Mishra came to meet Prabhupada. And when Prabhupada came to know, Prabhupada asked the devotees to arrange lunch. And they had lunch together and they had a very cordial, pleasant discussion. And then after that, Giraj Maharaj was there at that time. So Maharaj asked Prabhupada, Prabhupada, I thought he's a Mayavadi. You, you said he's a Mayavadi, isn't he? Prabhupada said, yes. He says, philosophically, we argue like anything. But culturally, we are friends. So philosophically, we argue like anything. We are, we are not that just that we are not dissolved our differences. We are not considered insignificant. But philosophy is not everything. Philosophy is one part of who, who we are and one part of who the person is. So culturally, we are friends. So Prabhupada could differentiate this. And how was he able to differentiate it? Because he didn't reduce. He didn't reduce the other person to just their philosophical orientation. So people are multifaceted beings. So people have their philosophical beliefs, people have their cultural practices, people have their personal behavior. So there are many aspects to individuals. When we reduce somebody to just one aspect, then we are manifesting what the Bhagavad Gita calls as knowledge in the mode of ignorance. In 1822, when Krishna says that ekasmin kutsnavit, that you take one thing and make it into everything. That Krishna says is knowledge in the mode of ignorance. That means we take one aspect of a person and make that into the whole person. What is this person? This person is a Mayavadi. Okay, their, their philosophy, philosophical beliefs might be impersonalist. But, that, but culturally, that person might still come and appreciate kirtan or worship deities or respect cows or go to holy places. So are we to not look at the cultural aspect at all? Are we to neglect that? We see, Mahaprabhu did say, Mayavad Bhashya Sunile Haile Sarvanash. But you know, every statement has a context. The context is that if we are not, if we are not mature enough, if we are not strongly grounded in our faith, then if we hear Mayavadis, then our faith may get damaged, it may get destroyed also. But there has to be, but Mahaprabhu himself heard Sarvam Bhattacharya for seven days. And he was very personally respectful. He didn't agree with Mayavad philosophy, but Mahaprabhu is an excellent example, especially his dealing with Sarvam Bhattacharya, of disagreement without disrespect. That he, he disagreed. But he didn't, there was no personal disrespect at all. Very personal warmth was there. Respect was there all the time. So why is that? Because Mahaprabhu saw other aspects. When, so when Gopinath Acharya is saying, you know, he is treating you like an ordinary person. You know, he is saying you are not God. He focuses on he is disrespecting you. But Mahaprabhu, what did he say? He looked at another aspect. He said, you know, he is, he is speaking out of concern for me. Although we have just met, he is like, he's like a father figure and he is concerned about me and my protection and my welfare as a renunciate. And that's why he's speaking things that I... So I, he appreciated that part. So what is Mahaprabhu doing? Maha, if he had wanted, he could have said, you know, he's a Mayavadi. I don't want to associate with him. 
but he didn't. He, he looked for something to appreciate, and he found something to appreciate. So just because somebody is a Mayavadi doesn't mean that they're always everything that they speak is going to be Mayavad, isn't it? it it's not that uh, philosophy is everything in their lives. They also have various aspects, and they will speak various things at various times. So there could be cultural similarities. There could be, a be there could be in terms of temperament. There could be similarities. So when we, when what is knowledge in the mode of ignorance? See, generally, knowledge removes ignorance. Tamasoma jyotirgama. That we go from darkness to light. We go from ignorance to knowledge. So what is knowledge in the mode of ignorance? What it means is, it is knowledge that doesn't remove ignorance but reinforces ignorance. That I gain the knowledge. But whatever ignorant conception I have, I only reinforce that with the knowledge that I gain. So it is like again very selective information. So if somebody is, if we label somebody the Mayavadi, then what happens? Then we will look for everything bad about that person. Oh, you know this person, there was this issue and that issue and that person did like that. Well, okay, they may have done some good things also. Why not look at that? No, because we have got, we have put a negative label on that person. So all the information that we will get is further going to reinforce that negative opinion only. So in such situations, our own intelligence is no longer clear where information is ending and where opinion is beginning. See, one of the, if we actually want to communicate effectively, we need to ourselves be clear. What are the facts and what are the feelings? Both have their importance. But if I get confused between information and opinion, if I myself equate my feelings with my facts, then I cannot make a coherent argument. So what happens is knowledge in the mode of ignorance means we can't differentiate between information and opinion. We can't differentiate between facts and feelings. And we look for only those facts which reinforce our feelings. We look for only that information which boosts our opinion. Hmm? This happens in every field. There is a philosopher of science who said that in science, the theories that we like, we call them facts. And the facts we don't like, we call them theories. <laughs> so this is just human bias. Again, this is not a criticism of science, because this happens in every this can happen in every area of life. So the point is that when we have this reductionistic vision, we reduce people down to some one attribute of theirs then that is where we exhibit knowledge in the mode of ignorance. And that is where our philosophical disagreements will degenerate to personal disrespect. Prabhupada could be very philosophically strong, but he was not personally disrespectful. When he met with people, he was warm with them. He was, he was cultured and caring with them. So, uh, Prabhupada knew how to engage with who. So when with Prabhupada, we know that he wanted to build the Juhu temple. He worked with many life members. Now most of these life members, they're very appreciative of Prabhupada, but they never became committed disciples of Prabhupada. So what was the reason? Many reasons, but one of the reasons was that many of these life members were already committed followers of other spiritual teachers. Hmm? They were already influential in society, and if they are spiritually inclined, what happens is that if they usually find some spiritual organization to align with. So Giriraj Maharaj was telling me, and I had talked about this with his own Radhanath Maharaj also. He also said the same thing. He said, I visited the life, I visited the houses of many of these prominent life members, especially in their last days. And if you go to their houses, they're like big pictures of their Mayavadi gurus were there in their homes, on their altars. And I asked him, did Prabhupada ever bring that up? He says, I don't remember even one incident where Prabhupada brought that up. He, what did he see? Okay, they may have that philosophical belief, but they are willing to do seva. They are helping in building the temple, not just giving funds, but providing contacts and clearing the obstacles. So engage them in seva. So Prabhupada focused on that. We say on the one of the fundamental criteria of bhakti is sarvopadi vinir muktam. Hmm? So we strive to become free from all labels. But the irony is, in following the process which is meant to free us from all labels, 
we impose a lot of labels on everyone else. <laughs> oh, this person Mayavadi, this person Karmi, this person Atheist, this person Meat Eater, this person like this. Well, okay, they may have those behaviors. But are all Mayavadis exactly the same? Among Mayavadis also there may be different categories. Are all meat eaters the same? You know, I will, okay, if you want to consider it, are all vegetarian people the same? No, there are vegetarian people who may be very pleasant and well behaved. And there will be vegetarian people who can be who can speak obnoxiously and who may be very rude and cruel. So same way, what happens is when we when we take one label and make it absolute. Okay, this person is a meat eater. Okay, that particular habit may be problematic. But their other behavior, they might be, they might be cordial, they might be generous, they might be uh, environmentally conscious. They may, they may be having many other good attributes. But if we don't see that, then that label starts restricting us. Restricting our capacity to appreciate how Krishna is acting in their life and what we can do to bring people closer to Krishna. And that's how what happens is philosophical disagreement degenerates into personal disrespect. But it doesn't have to. It doesn't have to. Because whatever be the label, and even however valid the label may be, people are bigger than the labels that they have. It's ironic that we say, I'm going to refute Mayavada. But... When we apply one label to everyone without considering any of other factors, we are actually practicing Mayavad. Because what is Mayavad? Mayavad is the refusal to see variety, to reduce everything to oneness. So if I don't see that, okay, all meat eaters are not the same. So I reduce all meat eaters to one, then what am I doing? I am actually practicing Mayavad because I am refusing to see variety. I am reducing everything to a non-differentiated oneness. So sometimes in the name of refuting impersonalism, we may increase our impersonalism. Now, I mean not philosophical impersonalism, but relational, personal impersonalism. Personal impersonalism. What does that mean? That in our personal interactions, we are very impersonal. So to avoid, avoid... Uh, getting uh, caught in this trap, uh, I'll conclude with this point, that how do we avoid letting personal disagreement degenerate, uh, sorry, uh, philosophical disagreement or any kind of disagreement degenerate to disrespect? No, we like, try to see beyond whatever labels we have applied to the Maya, to people. See, it is just subconscious that the world is very complex. And that is why to function in the world, we may need some labels. Okay, this person is a male, this person is a female. This person is English speaking, this person is Hindi speaking. These are, for all practical purposes, it's not that we can wish away labels. But, so Prabhupada also used labels, and sometimes used strong labels, like fools and rascals. But the difference was, Prabhupada didn't reduce people to those labels. In Burujan Prabhu's book, My Glorious Master, there's a very beautiful passage. When I first read it, it was like, a uh, thunderbolt struck me. Prabhupada is saying, a, a pure devotee prays to Krishna, all these fools and rascals are suffering in the material world. Krishna, please deliver all of them. So he's using the word fools and rascals, but he is not, that fools and rascals is not coming in a sense of condemnation. He is not losing his compassion amid that point. So he is not reducing people to fools and rascals. He's saying, yes, the way they are behaving right now may be foolish, may be worse than foolish. But still they are souls. Krishna, they are your precious parts. You want them to be delivered. So please make me an instrument in that. Please deliver them. So Prabhupada did not reduce people to labels even when he used the labels. But unfortunately what happens is, we only use the labels and we forget the purpose. Prabhupada's purpose was actually to elevate people. Elevate people. So, we try to see beyond the label. Our mind will, by default, put some labels on everyone. And functionally, sometimes it's required. But if we want to have a deeper interaction with others, then we try to see beyond the label. In fact, if we try to do that, our every interaction with others can become exciting. Because we all have certain labels. Oh, this person is too intellectual. This person is too critical. This person is too sentimental. And if we are simply, if we are going in a default mode, then our interactions will reinforce the labels. Yes, 
This is negative sentimental. But if we actually explore, can I find something about this person which will challenge the label I have for this person? Then we'll find the relationships, the interactions will become exciting. Because we'll be learning something about that person. And our own understanding will also grow by that. We will also become more broad-minded. So, broad-minded, how do you become broad-minded? He said, don't be narrow-minded. But what is narrow-minded? Narrow-minded means, we, in one sense, our mind produces some label and we reduce the reality down to that label. We narrow the reality down to that label. That's narrow-minded. So, broad-minded means what? Our mind will produce a label, but we, using our intelligence, see that reality is broader than the label. And when we see that, that's, that's the way to become broad-minded. To challenge our labels and to see how reality is bigger than our labels. And that's why Anyanindadi Shunya, the characteristic of pure devotee is no desire, to, no inclination to criticize others. Apaishunam, that aversion to fault finding. As I said, Krishna himself is God. He's the absolute authority. And he is discussing in the Bhagavad Gita about what is the right course of action. And Krishna in the 18th chapter talks about those whose recommendation is opposite to his. So he says, He's talking about Yagyadana Tapa and he says, some people say that these should be given up and others say these should not be given up. And Krishna says later on, Pavanani Manishinaha. These will purify even the great souls. Hmm? So these should be practiced. But significantly here, what is Tyajyam Doshavad Ittyeke? That there are some people who think that these are, should be given up because they are faulty. Karma Prahur Manishinaha. So Krishna is using the word Manishinaha for those people whose opinion is different from his opinion. He is saying Yagyadana Tapa should not be renounced. And he is saying those who say that Yagyadana Tapa should be renounced, they are also Manishinaha. Manishinaha means what? Mana Isha. Those who have controlled their mind. That means those are thoughtful people. They are not just driven by the chariot of their mind. They think. So now, if their opinion is different, so this is a classic example of Krishna himself demonstrating respect amid disagreement. He says, they, he says their opinion is wrong. But he says he is respecting the Manishina. Why? Because among the millions of people in the world, at least these people are thinking about how to become disentangled. And most people are so entangled that they don't even know they are entangled. Hmm? But these people are thoughtful enough to think about the way to, disagree, to disentanglement. Even if the path that they have chosen, that may be wrong. Their purpose is to be appreciated. And Krishna appreciates that purpose and therefore he calls them Manishina. So if we learn to look for something to appreciate in others, learn for something to challenge the negative labels that we tend to apply to others, then we will be able to prevent disagreement from degenerating into disrespect. And that is how we can live cordially even amid disagreement. You know, Prabhupada has built a house in which the whole world can live. That's what we often say. Now does that mean the whole world is going to agree about everything? No. The whole world, there are different devotees will come from different backgrounds, different, they have different natures. There will be disagreements. But we will be able to live together if we can learn to not see disagreement as deviation. I'm not saying that all disagreements are acceptable. Some disagreements can be deviations, of course. But the point is that if we default assume this person is disagreeing, that means this person is deviating. Then we will fight and we will, we will not be able to live together in Prabhupada's house. But the, if you want to live together in Prabhupada's house, this virtue which Krishna is exhibiting here in terms of his relationship, which Krishna is exhibiting in the Bhagavad Gita, of learning to respect even those whom we disagree with, that is vital, not just for our outreach to the world, but also for the maintenance even of our movement. That's how we can have six-fold loving exchanges, which Prabhupada said is the, is the, is the lifeblood, is the nourishment of the Krishna consciousness movement. So we can, be, we can learn to disagree without being disrespectful by contextualizing the disagreement. And this is just one part of who I am, not the whole of who I am or the whole of who this person is. So I'll summarize. I spoke three main points. First point I discussed is that 
<coughs> quite often respect will sorry disagreement leads to disrespect when we are in rajoguna or tamoguna because then we start raising our voice but satvik response is refine our argument so for doing that what do we need we need to actually consider that this this argument or this difference of opinion not everything so knowledge in the mode of ignorance means we reduce reality to whatever is our preconception and in religious organizations disagreement can lead to disrespect much more sometimes than in secular organizations because disagreement is seen as a deviation so what is something what is like the external that is taking me to the internal i may equate it with the internal and then if somebody is not valuing that external so much i may start thinking that this person is a deviant but this external is important for me because it's taking me to the internal but for somebody else some other external may be taking them to the internal so to uh, to avoid these negative this uh, agreement going to this disrespect what we need to do is not reduce people to labels but see that they are bigger than their labels just because somebody is a mayavadi or somebody is a meat eater doesn't mean everybody is one they also are different so find something to appreciate in others we discuss how prabhupad differentiated between cultural and philosophical how prabhupad appreciated uh, uh, even those whom he was calling fools and rascals he was seeing that he was having still having compassion how mahaprabhu appreciated sarom bhattacharya and how krishna himself appreciates those who say we should renounce the world so by such examples we also can learn this art of disagreeing without becoming disrespectful Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Looking for the key chai. Is there any one question? Yes, Krishna, bro. Thank you, Prabhu, for the super excellent class. now you know if you trace back uh, to krishna consciousness coming into india we see that uh, uh, people who had this culture of being respectful to the elders and uh, who were trained in that particular way you know for them to take up to this process of krishna consciousness became relatively easier not to say that others did not take but i would just give make just to make the point that uh, respect was such an important aspect of our cultural upbringing you know even say 30 40 years back but now uh, you know because of this advent of social media and the lack of training to the new generation on this very important aspect of respecting elders respecting the others when they are you know making a particular point uh, accepting that without really you know even even you may have a disagreement but still you be respectful so this is all a part of the training that uh, we all got and you know we imbibed from our elders and unfortunately this is lacking in this uh, present day and age so uh, moving forward how do you feel that you know the preaching of our krishna conscious philosophy would need to take in order to you know get such people also into the fold of krishna consciousness okay so the culture of respect is increasingly lost in today's world so how can we um, continue our spiritual outreach in such situations let me start from the opposite perspective that how so while respect is important sometimes this res- this the hierarchy of respect can become an obstacle i was just talking with one devotee scholar okay he is uh, he is a bhakti yoga scholar and he is he is appreciative of his con so he told me that he came to the temple and he liked the philosophy and he said that this was in america and he he liked the whole he liked the chanting also everything he liked and he started practicing and he says one day he just came and he asked the question prabhu uh can you explain this and suddenly the devotee next to him like literally slapped him he said you are committing an offense he's not a prabhu he's a maharaj now he knew nothing about it and this devotee didn't was not even discreet in that he was like quite uh, quite uh, overt in that so he felt that uh, 
that you know okay this whole process seems to be very complicated so i don't know when i will do what wrong and it is because of that for 6 months he stopped coming to the temple see so my point is that sometimes the path of the heart bhakti is the path of the heart we may put such a power structure and hierarchy within that and somebody does one thing wrong now i would say it's also problem not with the i'm not saying that the problem with the culture of respect but how that culture of respect is to be taught so this devotee that you are not respecting that maharaj he was making a point but he was not respecting this person when he was speaking that point so see the irony over there so you are not respecting but in that process i am not respecting you so what happens is the expectation of respect can become a problem hmm? it's not that there should not be respect but prabhupada prabhupada say about humility to not be anxious to have the satisfaction of being honored by others so my understanding is that it's not that respect is lost no if you see even in today's world somebody who becomes expert in a particular field they are respected hmm? it's not that uh, say if if we consider social media also you know if, now it's not always true but if there is a particular video which has got a lot of views some of them could be the artificial but quite often the content in that video is good if somebody does music which is good quality people appreciate it now i'm not saying that just the number count is necessarily an indicator of quality i'm not saying that but quite often if there is quality that is also respect respected but the difference is that with respect to especially the postmodern or egalitarian western culture is that respect cannot be assumed it has to be earned and that is a big problem in so, so if you see our movement wherever there is the hierarchical vertical culture in india in china in Re china, russia in the cia states krishna conscious movement is flourishing we are growing even in china although hinduism itself is not legal but a lot of people are becoming devotees discreetly but wherever that egalitarian culture is there that hierarchical culture is not there we are not able to reach out to a large number of people so why is that because we go expecting respect we assume respect should be there but respect has to be earned so yes should elders be respected as traditional culture is that oh you know elders should be respected but the contemporary attitude is okay just because you are older doesn't mean you are intelligent doesn't mean you are wise so you show me your wisdom then i'll respect you so it is not that uh, respect is not there but uh, of course i'm saying i'm saying that yes it is overall the way respect was given in the past it is not being given and disrespect is also very much there no i'm not denying that but to assume that there is no respect at all is not it's not true respect has to be earned it cannot be assumed that's why just because that's that's one of the difference i didn't highlight the difference between say religious organizations and spiritual groups or spiritual people just so it's traditionally even in india if somebody is say wearing saffron or somebody is uh, is a leader of a spiritual organization or in some influential position that will bring some respect okay but in the west it no, doesn't matter i'm not my best i'm not only talking about america basically wherever there's egalitarian kind of culture okay you have some post i don't care show me your wisdom if you have wisdom then i'll respect you so religious hierarchy will not be respected but spiritual caliber will be respected but spiritual caliber people cannot see that directly they can see the position of religious hierarchy but that will not give them respect but if somebody actually offers spiritual has spiritual substance offers spiritual substance they will that will be respected so respect has to be earned and that is even among see in among our teenagers if we consider they actually need guidance but what they feel is that you know my parents or my elders are from a completely different generation and what they speak doesn't make any sense to me so if if somebody gives guidance in a way that is sensible they take it it's not that they don't take it unfortunately the many of the people who make sense to them don't give good guidance that is the problem but if we can understand their way of thinking and then try to present it in a way that makes sense to them 
So respect will have to be earned. What was I think Mark Twain, he said that when I was 17, uh, my father was a fool. Now I'm 25 and I'm amazed how much my old man has learned in the eight years. <laughs> so what happened is, that by the time he became 25, his own, he also became mature. So he started thinking, he started appreciating that wisdom. So it takes time. So if I found that if we don't assume respect, but we act as I answer questions politely, deal with people respectful, in, a, in, a, in a respectable way, then respect can be earned. Okay? Thank you very much. Granthraj Srimad Bhagavatam ki, Srila Prabhupada ki, Gaur Bhakta Vrinda ki, Itai Gaur Primanandi.